Greetings, everyone. Welcome back into Calc 2. Time to talk about adding some more ideas to polar coordinates. And among those ideas, start tying polar coordinates into the calculus that we know and love and need to use when we're uh, investigating and analyzing these types of curves. So as you've already seen, polar coordinates is just an alternate system of graphing uh, on the same grid, basically. It's the same exact plane of existence. It's just a different way of looking at the, the way that we can locate the points on that grid. And of course, doing these things in this format also gives us an entirely different set of curves that are possible. Uh, I want to reiterate the, the symmetries, and then we need to talk about converting between the, the, um, the systems that we've been using, and then we're going to introduce some calculus into uh, these uh, curves and the analysis of these curves. So look real quick on the symmetry here. By symmetry we mean uh, the, the way that the shapes are the same on either side of either an axis or the, the center origin point. Okay, In polar coordinates the x-axis is called the polar axis and if I have some shape that has the symmetry around the x-axis then you'll notice in the equation that I could replace theta with negative theta with no change in the equation. Right? So notice here, cosine of negative theta, cosine's an even function, cosine of negative theta is just the same thing as cosine theta, which is why you're getting the symmetry uh, above and below the polar axis here, the x-axis. Okay, symmetry on the y-axis is really just symmetry on the line theta equals pi over 2. And with these kinds of equations, you'll notice that if you replace theta with pi minus theta, right? Now notice pi is a number where theta is still your variable, okay? Or if you replace r with negative r and theta with negative theta, then you will get no change, okay? And from here, you'll note sine of pi minus theta, okay? is equal to the, the sine of theta. It's the way we have our identities set up with, uh, with the sine function, right? Or vice versa. If I were to put negative r here and negative theta here, uh, sine being an odd function, I would have a negative sine theta, and it would be equal to negative r. So the two negatives would basically wipe out, leaving me with r equals 4 sine theta again. Okay, so either way you look at this, this gives me this kind of left-right symmetry across the y-axis or the line theta equals pi over 2. There's not a special name for the y-axis you'll notice here, right? Theta equals pi over 2 should make sense, right? Because it's just rotating theta from the standard position up to the y-axis. Um, and then, of course, origin symmetry is another important one that we see a lot in, in all of our algebra and calculus. And the origin is called the pole because it's the, the way, the, the mode of rotation, right, for your angles. It's the center of the rotation of your angles. So they call it the pole, uh, kind of like the, the way the Earth rotates on its north and south pole, right? Um, now, when you, when you have uh, this kind of symmetry on the pole, the easiest way to see this is just replacing R with negative R. Uh, because if you have some sort of rotation from an angle, right, R facing one way goes through the origin, right? The origin is where the R uh, comes from when you are graphing a point in polar coordinates. So if you have R and you switch it to negative R, okay, you're going to have this sort of origin symmetry. Notice here in the lemniscate that's formed when you have r squared is equal to 9 sine 2 theta, which, by the way, is, a, is just a rose curve with four petals, but two of the petals get cut off when you square the r because of the, the way r squared can't be equal to the negative values of sine. So what you get is this, this nice pretty lemniscate that's at a 45 degree angle here. Uh, incidentally, if this were the cosine, it would be a, a left-right one, right? Uh, it would be touching the, the x-axis, I mean. So, <clears throat> anyway, 
Um, I've got r squared equals nine sine two theta. And if I replace r with negative r, notice the squared would wipe out the negative on the r and it'd be the same equation, okay? This thing has origin symmetry uh, only in this case. Now, of course, there are other shapes that have more than just that one type of symmetry. Of course, if I had a circle centered at the origin, that would have all of those symmetries, right? Uh, replacing r with negative r, replacing theta with negative theta, uh, all of those things would, would have the same effect. These are good examples because these are examples that only have that one type of symmetry, but there's symmetry in all of them. And really the way to test is, is literally just to look at your, uh, at your r and theta variables and see can I replace this with a negative and will it make a difference in the equation and which symmetry does that uh, allocate me to. Uh, also it helps to already know the shape, right? If I already know that r equals sine of something like this is going to be a circle that is uh, above the origin you know, centered around the y-axis, well naturally it's going to have y-axis symmetry, right? If I know which equations give me the lemnus gates, which uh, equations give me the cardioids and the lemasons and, and things like that, then of course that also helps with recognizing the symmetry. And, and don't forget r equals just some basic increasing function of theta, like r equals theta, r equals e to the theta, those are all spirals, right? those are not going to have the same kind of symmetry. They're not going to be the same above and below because the spiral keeps uh, growing outwards, that kind of thing. Okay, now we've talked about uh, parametric equations at the beginning of this unit leading up to now that we're on polar coordinates. And of course, it's important to be able to convert between systems. We started with rectangular, right? That's the one you've been doing for years. Now, uh, and recently we've introduced you to parametric, and now we're talking about polar, and might be your second time seeing polar, who knows? Well, uh, in any case, to be able to switch in between those three is pretty handy, especially when the calculus side starts coming in, okay? So converting from polar to parametric is a, is a really important, uh, useful feature, and it's actually quite simple. If I have r equals some function of theta, right, like any of these, r equals some function of theta, r equals some function of theta. Here I would have to uh, solve for r by, by placing a square root and then I would have to make some concessions like where is r positive, where is r negative, that, uh, that kind of thing, okay? But as long as I can get it into r equals some function of theta, okay, then my parametric form of the curve is just gonna be x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. That should sound familiar, either from your trig days or from more recent calculus days, okay? That's how we have that connection between polar and rectangular coordinates, right? We say that x is r times the cosine of theta, y is r times the sine of theta. But here, notice what that means is r is some function of theta, so we're basically coming at it from the other direction. x is going to then be whatever that function is times cosine theta. Y is gonna be whatever that function is times sine theta. And then you have a parametric equation set up. Notice, here's a rectangular form of a line. Y equals five X plus seven. If I convert this into polar form by letting Y be R sine theta, X be R cosine theta, then I subtract the five R cosine theta over factor out the r, divide over the rest, right? Then I've converted into polar form. This is the same thing as that, but I've converted it into polar after I've solved for r, okay? So this is your polar function right here. r is some function of theta. And it still graphs to the same line. But if I wanted to have another parametric form of that, then what I would do is I would take this function of theta that's equal to r, and I would say that uh, I have r times cosine theta. Notice, see, it's the seven over sine minus five cosine times cosine, and then seven over sine minus five cosine times sine. So that's a parametric form of this same polar uh, uh, function, okay? And actually, if you're gonna do this stuff with technology, a lot of times having the 
parametric form of a polar curve is actually easier to type or program into a lot of these things that don't have a pre-made polar function setup. Even GeoGebra, uh, it's easier for me to put all of this stuff into parametric form if I know a polar curve that I want to graph. Uh, GeoGebra has really good graphics of the polar grid and things like that, uh, but it's easier to design uh, functions in polar form that have been converted into a parametric version of the polar curve just by multiplying uh, cosine and sine to your x and y and putting it into your curve function uh, to make it a parametric curve. Okay, so it's very handy to be able to convert these for technology's sake, uh, for your understanding as well. Uh, but then now, when we move into the calculus part of this, it becomes almost essential to sort of remember that understanding part of it here. We've already talked about how to do derivatives and integrals of a parametric curve, right? If I have something in parametric form, it's very easy for us to make a bridge here from those derivatives and integrals to these, okay? Especially the derivative part. If I want to do dy over dx, then that's really just dy d theta over dx d theta. A lot like the parametric one, right? I, I just had t's there instead of thetas. But really, what's the difference? It's just another variable, right? So really what I'm doing here with dy d theta is I'm taking the theta derivative of r sine theta, right? Because that's this. And then the theta derivative of r cosine theta for the, for the x portion, right? Because that's this. However, in this case, the r represents a function of theta, right? That's, that's this. So it becomes a product rule in the numerator and denominator. And so really what I have here is r prime times sine plus r times cosine and r prime times cosine minus r times sine using the product rule to get each of those. Where r prime represents the theta derivative of whatever function r is equal to. Okay, so this just gives you a way of setting up a dy over dx. Remember, we're still using that same definition of derivative on the grid where we have our y versus our x. If you just want an r and theta derivative, well, that's just what r prime is. But you have to really think about what that means. r prime here is not the same thing as dy over dx. You understand derivative from calc 1 as dy over dx as the slope of a tangent line. Whereas r prime being the df over d theta here is not necessarily that same thing. Okay? The change in r as theta changes is going to be how, how your radius coming away from the origin is either growing or shrinking as theta is rotating. So you have to imagine theta rotating in a positive direction like this, right? Theta, theta is going to be rotating. So if I, if I have my, my radius, okay, the radius from the origin here is this, okay? Then d theta is actually a, a perpendicular direction like this. The change in theta makes, you, makes it want to do this, rotate like this. Okay, uh, the theta direction is supposed to be perpendicular to the r direction. That's what makes it a uh, a standardized system. Okay, so d theta is a very very small piece of angular change in this rotating direction. And if I say d f d theta or r prime, that's going to be how much is this radius changing? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? as this thing rotates. So as you can see, what the point I'm trying to make is, it's not the same thing as dy over dx, which is I have some curve through space and I wanna know the slope of the line that's tangent to it. That's not necessarily the same as what we're talking about here, okay? So back to the original point. When we talk about derivatives, a lot of times on a curve, something that we're analyzing, dy dx being that derivative, I just wanna know, hey, What's the slope of this line that's tangent to it so that I can talk about 
uh, the, the actual shape of the curve itself, okay? Whereas I may be using polar coordinates to get the idea of that curve out there, to analyze it, we still go back to our same old dy over dx, which we can calculate using r's and thetas in this manner, okay? Now, area, okay? Area here is based off of a trigonometric formula for area. You may or may not remember. Um, if you're not as familiar with this, go to my trig series and look at the, the first lecture video that starts talking about the connection between radians uh, and the, the physical you know, rotations on a circle. And one of the things that we talk about is how we can find the area of a sector of a circle. So if you have a circle, and the center is here, if you have some sector of it, right, which is using two radii to map out a region inside of the circle, the area of a sector here, if, I, if my radius is r, and I have some angle theta here, okay, the area of that sector is one half theta r squared. That's using radians for the theta now. Okay, so you gotta be careful here. Uh, all of this is gonna be in radians. Okay, using these things here. Now, when we're graphing some of these, I know sometimes we'll use, um, we'll use uh, degrees just to help us visualize. But in the end, a lot of this stuff, you're gonna wanna connect it back to radians, especially here now. Okay, so if you think about this area formula here, uh, what I'm doing when I'm, when I'm drawing one of these curves is theta is my input variable. Theta is the thing that's changing, okay? And then r is the consequence. If I give it a theta, r is here. If I give it another theta, r is over here, right? So as theta changes, it's like I'm sweeping out some angular region between the origin and the curve. So you see the origin is a common point and my different thetas are gonna have different R values that point in different places, okay? So when you do the area here, you're basically stacking radii, stacking R values on top of each other, right? Until you sweep out a whole region of area. And to get that area, it's like doing the area of a sector. I have to do one half times R squared times the angle, okay? However, since I'm integrating little slices, right? I'm doing little slices just like, just like in normal um, rectangle calculus, okay? D theta is the thickness because it's one, one tiny little amount of rotation, right? One itty bitty little rotation between each one that I'm stacking up. So that's D theta, that's my actual theta. But then I'm doing it from one value of theta to another and then there's your one half r squared. So when I do this integral, okay, I'll actually get something more complicated than just circles. I can do any polar curve, and I can do the, the area uh, between those two values of theta. And I can do area between polar curves. I can do area that's uh, either inside of a loop or outside of a loop or both and then subtract, whatever. Okay, so it works just like all of the other ideas of area that you've had before. Arc length, also not much different uh, as far as the ideas. You just have to know that when I'm picking my two theta values, right, I have a starting theta value, I have an ending theta value, that's gonna map out a piece of your curve, and then I'm going to set up this integral. It may look a little bit familiar, right? I have the square root, I have the two quantities squared, but you'll notice that it's r squared and r's derivative with theta squared, that's a, a consequence of plugging in all of your dy d thetas and dx d thetas in, right? Just like with these formulas here, I'm plugging those things in and squaring, and you get a lot of uh, cross uh, um, reductions and, and things with sine squareds and cosine squareds, and you end up with this nice pretty formula, okay? So these are, these are some of the things that we want to now get some examples of. Uh, I want to talk about 
the, the calculus that goes along with uh, using a polar curve. So let's, let's start with some examples of derivatives now. For our first set of examples here, I'm just going to do some stuff that we always do with derivatives, but we're going to do it in the polar format, right? So find the equation of a tangent line, right? I've got r equals 4 sine theta, which we know is the circle above the origin, symmetrically centered on the y-axis. Um, has a, a technically a radius of 2, right? A full height of 4. And we want to know the tangent line to this curve at theta equals 2 pi over 3. Okay, so let's start with finding our derivative calculation, right? dy over dx. Um, let me first write down what r prime is, right? r prime is going to be negative four, not negative, positive four uh, cosine theta, right? That's gonna be my r prime here, all righty. So dy over dx is going to be the r prime times uh, sine theta. So that's 4 cosine theta sine theta plus the r times cosine theta. So that's 4 sine theta times cosine theta. Right, that was the dy over d theta portion. Right, that was the y sine theta, uh, y equals r sine theta derivative piece. So I had r prime sine theta and r and cosine theta. So in the bottom I have the dx part, right, which is going to be r prime for cosine theta times cosine theta. So it's just squared. Right, let me let me make that a little bit neater. Uh, it's just squared. Minus r right for sine theta. Okay, times negative sine theta. That's where the, the minus is coming from, right? So and the, that basically just gives me a sine theta times a sine theta, which is sine squared theta. Okay, so right here, I'm hoping that you're gonna notice. Uh, that I can basically uh, um, factor out a 4 here, right, and a 4 here, and basically just wipe them out. And then in the numerator, that's going to leave me with 2 sine theta, cosine theta, because there's two of them and I'm adding them. And in the bottom, all I did was factor out the 4s. That's going to leave me with cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Now, hopefully, you're recognizing those identities. 2 sine theta cosine theta. Okay? Is equal to sine 2 theta. And cosine squared minus sine squared uh, of theta is cosine 2 theta. And since they both have the same angle, I can just divide that out into tangent of 2 theta. There's my dy over dx equivalent calculation. If I want to know the slope of the tangent line with y and x, I can simply use tangent of 2 theta. And I've got a theta value that I'm interested in calculating. Right? I'm interested in calculating at theta equals 2 pi over 3. So, uh, my slope of my tangent line, right, that's what I'm doing is a tangent line, my slope is going to be uh, the tangent of 2 times 2 pi over 3, which is going to be 4 pi over 3. Uh, tangent of 4 pi over 3, that's just an angle uh, that's a value that's in quadrant 3, 4 pi over 3 is, uh, with a reference angle of pi over 3. Tangent of that is square root of 3, and tangent in the third quadrant is positive, 
So I'm just getting square root of 3. There's my slope of my line. Okay? Remember M, I'm just using that for uh, slope so that I can put it in my point slope form. My X value is going to be R times cosine. Right? So I have 4 sine 2 pi over 3 times cosine 2 pi over 3. So then my x value, and remember that's that's because we're, we're doing this on a certain point of the circle. Okay, so I need a point and I need a slope. That's what I'm finding here. Uh, my x value, uh, sine of 2 pi over 3, that's like, uh, that's the sine of 120 and the cosine of 120. Cosine is going to be negative. Okay, the sine of course is going to be positive, and they're both based off of 60 degrees. So that's going to be uh, square root of 3 over 2 and negative 1 half. Okay, so then my x value here is just going to end up being my negative square root of 3. Right, that's my x value. My y value something very similar except it's just going to be uh, the sine squared. So it'll be 4 square root of 3 over 2 squared, right? Uh, that's going to give me a 4 over 4 which is 1 and then square root of 3 squared uh, which is 3. So I just get 3. Okay. So then let's write down all that we have here. I've got y minus 3 is equal to square root of 3 times x minus negative square root of 3. But of course if I distribute y minus 3 is equal to square root of 3 times x plus 3. Square root of 3 times square root of 3 is 3. And now if I add 3 to both sides, I have y is equal to square root of 3 times x plus 6. And there's my tangent line to the curve at that point. Okay? So remember what we're looking at here is uh, r equals 4 sine theta is just that circle sitting on top of the here, I'll draw it in right here. Give myself a little space right here. We're talking about that circle that sits right on top like this, right? And 2 pi over 3 is about right here-ish. So when we're drawing this tangent line, we're looking at the equation right here of this line right here. Right? I want the equation of that line. So it makes sense that it would go through at 6, right? Since the height of this is 4, it's going to be a little bit above it over here. Okay? And then my slope just happens to be the, the square root of 3, about 1.73-ish. Okay, next. Calculate the values of theta where dy over dx is equal to 1. So I want to know certain values of uh, or locations on the curve where I know that the slope of my tangent line is a slope of 1. Okay, and of course there's going to be multiple locations. R equals e to any kind of theta like this is a spiral graph. And since this is a positive exponent on the e, it's a spiral graph that gets larger as theta increases. So we're looking at a graph that, you know, does something, you know, like this. Okay? And it keeps going. Of course, uh, I'm not drawing it enough to scale here. This thing gets really large. Outward and outward and outward. Okay. A slope of 1, don't forget, is a, is a slope, you know, in going in the positive uh, x and y directions like that. So we're looking at 
locations on here that would be like right here, this type of thing, right here, this type of thing, uh, right here-ish, right? Uh, right here-ish, okay? One thing that you're gonna notice though is that all of these things actually line up. I didn't draw it to scale, but all of them are gonna line up in this one line that they're all perpendicular to because of the way uh, the, ta uh, the uh, derivative is gonna work here, as you'll see in a second. <coughs> okay, so let's start by finding our dy over dx so that we have something to solve. Uh, of course, r prime here is just gonna be 1 sixth e to the theta over six, right? That's just the derivative of that with respect to theta. So then dy over dx is going to be equal to r prime times cosine, so 1 sixth e to the theta over 6 times cosine theta, plus r times, uh, whoops, got it backwards, it's sine theta. Sorry. Next one is times cosine, so that's e to the theta over 6 cosine over r prime 1 sixth e to the theta over 6 times cosine minus r e to the theta over 6 times sine theta. Now lucky for us, we have e to the theta over 6 in all four locations. So basically I can factor out an e to the theta over 6 and just wipe it out basically you know, reducing it as a fraction would from the top and the bottom. I can, I can just reduce the, the exponential parts out. That makes it a lot easier. Something else I'm gonna do though, is I'm going to multiply by six to both the top and the bottom and distribute. So basically times six, times six, times six, and times six in those, those four locations. Uh, and it, it just makes my derivative a little bit easier looking. Uh, I'll have sine theta plus six cosine theta over cosine theta minus six sine theta, like so. Okay, and we're interested in where this is equal to one, right? I want the derivative, this thing, equal to one. So if this thing were equal to one, I could actually multiply this denominator over times one and it would just be itself. And this is the equation we would get. Sine theta plus six cosine theta is equal to cosine theta minus six sine theta. Right, I just multiplied it to the other side. From here, I'm just going to mix and match, right? I'm going to subtract cosine from both sides, and I'm going to subtract sine from both sides. If I subtract cosine here, that's gonna give me five times cosine theta, and if I subtract sine from both sides, I'll have negative seven sine theta. Okay, now I'm gonna divide both sides by negative seven. That's gonna give me negative five sevenths on this side and I'm gonna divide both sides by cosine theta. If I divide by cosine, it gets rid of it on this side, and then sine theta divided by cosine theta is tangent theta. Well, now I have a very simple trigonometric equation that I need to solve generically, right? Calculate the values, uh, right? There seems to be an infinite number of these things. The more the spiral goes around, the more of these I get. There should be an infinite of them. And this equation is telling you that very thing. Absolutely. Okay, now the, the way I solve trig equations, and if you're rusty on this, again, I urge you, go look at my trig series. I have two very wonderful videos on solving trig equations. I do it with two pieces of information, okay? I notice the mixture of the tangent with the negative sign that tells me quadrants, in this case, quadrants two and four. Notice quadrants two and four, right? Starting to make sense. 
And then I also notice tangent with the five sevenths is going to give me my reference angle, which is just inverse tangent of positive five sevenths. Notice it's positive five sevenths. I separate that out. You don't need the negative on the five sevenths when you're doing your inverse to solve this equation. You just need to know that the negative is part of it so that you pick the correct quadrants, okay? Now, the, the reference angle here is something very, quite uh, nasty, okay? Uh, I wrote it down. It's 2.5213. Uh, Is act, well, I, no, that's not the reference, I'm sorry. Uh, let me go ahead and type it in real quick. I'm in radian mode, inverse tangent of five over seven is 0.62-ish, okay? So this reference angle right here is around 0 0.62, 0.025-ish, uh, okay? Now, what this tells me is in quadrant two, right, theta is going to be pi minus the reference angle. Pi minus the reference angle, okay? Which is approximately, uh, and that's where I'm getting my, my 2.5213. Okay, in quadrant four, my theta is two pi minus the reference. Okay, because it's all the way over in quadrant four and then it comes back a little bit. And that one, if you'll notice, is just the same thing as this, but plus another pi, right? So it's whatever 2.51 or 213 plus pi is, okay? And here's the cool thing. That's why these things are on a line. If you draw a line right here, like this, okay? All of these are gonna be on that same directional line. And so what's happening is every pi, okay? You keep hitting another one. So what is this telling me? Follow this pattern. All of my thetas, generically, are approximately 2.5213 plus n times pi, where n is any integer. Right? That's our, that's our qualifier. The, the double line z is that n can be any whole number, positive or negative. n is any integer okay so these are the locations of theta that actually give me these slopes right here the first one that gets hit is the the 2.5213 notice it's in quadrant two and that's exactly what's happening you see right here i get that first one in quadrant two then the next one in quadrant four boom then back to quadrant two again and they're only pi apart from each other. Once you hit that first one, it's another pi rotation, a pi radians, and another pi radians, and another pi radians, and so on and so on. And that's how we get an infinite number of them. Okay, find all the, crit uh, the critical values, basically, is what this next one's asking, right? Find all the horizontal and vertical tangent locations on a curve. R equals three plus four cosine theta is one of our Limasan cardioid types. It has the inner loop. How do I know that? Because the trig function is more powerful than the number. See, four cosine, right, is more than the number. Cosine is negative sometimes, which is gonna cause um, the, the four eventually at some points to overtake the three, in which case I get a negative R value. And that's how you get that inner loop on your Limasan. Okay, so we're looking at something of this kind of shape. And, and I know we already, I already had a, one of these drawn out in the first scene. There's a couple of things I want to point out here. So here's, here's what our curve looks like. Basically, 
So it's a real quick drawing here. Uh, we'll look at GeoGebra in a minute and you'll be able to see a lot better. Okay? But let's count it just from knowing the shape, right? Well, here's a horizontal up here and there's one at the bottom, right? So that's two. But then what about the inner loop? The inner loop has to come all the way around, right? The inner loop is going to have a couple also. So there's actually four horizontal spots. What about vertical? One. And then look, on the inside, two. And then right here up at this top point, three. And then right here at this point down right here, that's vertical right here, four. Okay, so I've got vertical tangents here, 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 here. Those are all vertical tangents. I've got horizontal tangents up here, right here, right here, and right here. Okay, so I'm going to be finding a lot of critical values here. So let's start uh, with finding our derivative, right? Okay, so my r prime uh, derivative of 3, of course, is 0. And then this is going to be negative 4 sine theta. It's my r prime. Okay. So dy over dx. dy over dx is going to be this r prime times sine theta. So I get sine squared, right? Because it's r prime times another sine theta plus r, which is 3 plus 4 cosine theta, times cosine theta over r prime times cosine, so that's negative 4 sine theta, cosine theta, minus r, which is 3 plus 4 cosine theta, times sine theta. Okay, now let's distribute some things out and combine what we can here, okay? So right here, let's see, I'll just go to the next line. dy over dx is equal to, I have negative 4 sine squared, right? Next I have uh, plus 3 cosine theta, and then plus 4 cosine squared theta. And then in my denominator over here, I'm actually going to go a different route. Instead of distributing and combining, uh, I actually have something that will combine easier if I just notice that everything is going to have a sine theta. And I can just factor it out. So like this, sine theta times, I'll use square brackets, I have negative 4. Oh, actually, let me pull out a negative too, uh, a negative sine theta. That's going to leave me with 4 cosine theta, right, plus 3 plus 4 cosine theta, like that. I'm just making the, the, the denominator a little bit easier on myself there. Okay, now in the numerator, I want to be able to combine everything as uh, one trig function if I can. So for the sine squared right there, what I'm going to do is replace this sine squared right here with 1 minus cosine squared. Okay? So if I do that, notice what I'm going to get is a negative 4, right? And a negative 4 times negative cosine squared, which is 4 cosine squared. 4 cosine squared plus another 4 cosine squared is going to give me 8 cosine squared theta. Okay, I still have plus 3 cosine theta. 
but I've also now got a minus 4. And then in my denominator, I still have a negative sine theta. And now it's times, I have 8 cosine theta plus 3. Okay, so I've simplified uh, the, the trig as much as possible now. Now it's time for me to look for the vertical and horizontal uh, values uh, independently. Because remember, this is the derivative dy over dx, right? Um, it's going to be horizontal when the numerator is 0. And it's going to be vertical when the denominator is 0. Okay, so let's, uh, let's solve those right here. Let's do the vertical ones first. Okay, the vertical tangents. This is going to happen either when sine theta is equal to zero. Notice that's one piece and it's multiplied. So either sine theta is equal to zero, which that gives me theta is equal to zero or pi or two pi or blah, blah, blah. Uh, I should note right here that our theta really only needs to be defined from 0 to 2 pi for this particular curve. Okay, unlike this one over here that can go on and be something different forever. This one is periodic and repeats. So I only need 0 to 2 pi. So right here, 0 and pi are two of my vertical tangents. Well, that should make sense. 0 and pi is this location and this location, those two points right there. Okay, those are the, the two quick and obvious ones, right? Okay, so then where do I get more of my vertical tangents from? Uh, where 8 cosine theta plus 3 is equal to 0. So I'll put an or here. This tells me that cosine theta is equal to negative 3 eighths. And... Solving that one the same way, very similar to, to this guy over here. Uh, cosine is negative in quadrants 2 and 3. Okay, should make sense to you, right? Here's the quadrant 2 one, here's the quadrant 3 one. Okay, so quadrants 2 and 3. And then I just use the inverse cosine of positive 3 eighths. And then I subtract it from pi and I add it to pi. That's quadrant 2 is pi minus, quadrant 3 is pi plus, okay? <clears throat> um, uh, I'm starting with the, the degrees right here, okay? So from this one, I have 112.02 degrees, okay? That theta is approximately. And then the other one, is 247.98 degrees. Now I wrote these in degrees just to give you the, the visual side here, okay? The visual side is, as you can see, the 112 degrees is when theta is here, right? It's pointing out this way to this point. And then the 247, you can see it's pointing down this way to this point right here. So those are my other two vertical tangents. And of course, what are those uh, in radians? Um, 112.02 times pi over 180. I got 1.955-ish. In radians. Okay. And then uh, 247.98, 4.328-ish. Uh, of course, if I were to do, uh, just leave it in radians and do my inverse cosine, 1.955, yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so good enough. That's my two vertical, uh, those are my four vertical tangents, right? Zero, pi, and then these two are my four vertical tangents. Now, what about the horizontal tangents? The horizontal tangents are 
right? Horizontal tangents are going to happen when the numerator is zero. 8 cosine squared theta plus 3 cosine theta minus 4, which is a quadratic in cosine theta. So, of course, what I'm going to do is the quadratic formula. Uh, that's going to give me negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 3 squared is 9 minus 4 times 8 times negative 4. So basically, uh, 4 times 8, 32 times 4, right, 128, uh, over 2 times a. 2 times 8 is 16. So what I'm getting is that cosine theta is equal to either negative 3 plus or negative 3 minus the square root of 137 over 16. So I've actually got two equations there, right? I need to solve uh, cosine theta is equal to negative 3 plus square root of 137 over 16, or cosine theta is equal to negative 3 minus square root of 137 over 16. And of course, uh, at this point, it's all calculator work now because you're really just going to do uh, whatever is necessary. Um, this is the cosine is equal to a positive number. So I'm getting quadrants one and four here. Okay. So the, 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 the solutions to this first one here, since this is a positive number, are going to be this location and this location. That's your quadrants one and four. Okay. And then over here, this cosine theta is equal to a negative number, right? You can tell because it's just adding up to a negative in the numerator there. And since it's equal to a negative number, you're getting quadrants two and three. But it's also locations in quadrants two and three where my r happens to be negative. So since r happens to be negative in quadrant two, let's say, negative r from quadrant two lands me right here in this part of the inner loop. And then in quadrant three, theta is facing this way, but r is negative this way. So it lands me right here on this little location there. So even though this is going to give me quadrants two and three because of the negative that the cosine is equal to, because r is also negative uh, for those, I'm actually getting the, the other two quadrants, but on the inner loop, okay? So then... What I've computed from these, <clears throat> if you do your, your, your inverse and do the proper quadrants, uh, if I do the inverse cosine of the positive is one of the answers, the, uh, the angle in degrees is 57.04. And then of course, if you take that as your reference angle and then subtract it from 360, you have your 302.96. Okay, now those are, those are the two locations of the big top and bottom from this equation. And then of course the, the theta here, uh, they come out to be 156.8 degrees and 203.2 uh, degrees, right? Those are those locations, which of course you can uh, convert to your radians, right? Uh, this has got to be really close to one radian right here. 0.9955 radians. This one's 5.2876 radians. 156.8. 2.73668-ish. And 203. This is 
five, four, six, five ish. Uh, one. Okay. So, as you can see, what's happening is, right, these two answers here are your quadrants one and four. The, that's the, the 57 degrees, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not actually drawing the scale. It's going to be a, a lot more outward, right? It's going to be more up this way. And then, of course, the, the 302 is practically this, it's exactly the same angle, just in the downward direction, right? Uh, so you got to get your symmetry here uh, for those two. And then, of course, these are the angles that are in uh, the other quadrants, right? It's, it's facing this way outward for my theta, but my R is opposite. So that's how I'm getting this on the inner loop and then vice versa on the other one, okay? So I have those four locations for the horizontal tangents uh, on there, okay? Um, let me show you what this looks like in GeoGebra so that you can get a, an even better visual uh, on these. So let's take a look at these three examples that we just worked. Um, the first thing you should notice is I'm not using a rectangular grid in my GeoGebra screen. I actually have the polar graphing grid here to help us visualize the rotational uh, locations. It's an easy switch um, in between the two in the, in the settings is all. That's all. Anyway, um, the way I have this one set up is uh, it will actually draw the shape for us and you can follow the path of the actual theta value by following this red dot right here that I've labeled theta. So here, take a look. This is our shape right now, and you see as theta goes along, R is going to be the little blue line to the, the dot P. And as it draws our shape, okay, so notice it's only at pi and it's already completed the full circle there. If I let it keep going, it would just continue to draw around. But notice theta is down here, but r is negative. In other words, it's pointing the opposite direction of theta, which causes it to continue to draw on the same shape, which is what you'd expect, because this should be the only shape that we have for this function. Okay, now the point in question was 2 pi over 3 okay that's the that's the point that I'm picking and then I'm turning it on right here this is this is that point uh, to 2 pi over 3 that is the location that that one is uh, on this function on this graph right so it's gonna be right about there okay so then the the tangent line on this point is going to be this line right here. And notice it's written in standard form, but you have the, the negative 1.73 here. That's square root of 3 times x. Notice the equation right here of this guy, uh, if I were to put it in a different format, if I can put it in a different format, let's see. Uh, yeah, I can. Here we go. And that's the format that we had uh, on our example right there, right? Y equals square root of 3x plus 6. That's our actual uh, tangent line there for this guy, for this particular um, curve. Okay, so then the next curve was e to the theta over 6. So I'll just change my r function here okay so you'll notice that what I'm actually doing is I'm using parametric equations in a curve format to graph these polar functions but it's it's done in such a way that is still a a polar um, uh, type of uh, approach so here we go. Here's the here's the curve right here. Notice it started at right at one there, and then as we go out, you can see the R steadily growing. 
So the more this thing goes out, right, the more it's going to continue to do that. Uh, let me um, let me let this thing go further here. Uh, let's let it go even further. Let's put that slider maximum here to something other than two pi. Let's let's get it really far up there to like fifty if we can. Okay. Whoops. So now it's going to draw a little faster because of the, the maximum value that we've picked here. I'm going to zoom out a bit. Let's see. I'm going to turn off the grid for a second if I can. Here we go. Polar grid is what we're on. I'm going to turn it off for a second so that you can see the curve better. So this is our curve right here. This is that spiral that we talked about. Notice it's getting really, really large uh, from our original spiral, which is way down in here. Um, okay, and the question on this one was calculate different values of theta where the derivative of y versus x, dy over dx, the slope of the tangent line is equal to 1. Okay, and what we calculated was the first basic one was on the value of 2.5213. Okay. Let me turn on that point there. Notice where the point is right here, right? Right there. And then notice the slope of the line up here. It's 1x. So if I turn that on, you see that is definitely a slope of 1 tangent line. So here's what we can do from here. Notice if I were to add pi. So that's 1 pi. Look at what happens. The point jumps over here, but the slope stays at 1. So the point has jumped just to the other side here. And the more I keep adding pi's, you'll notice it'll keep jumping back and forth between the different parts of this spiral. So right here I have plus pi right now. If I do plus 2 pi, it jumps to that side. If I do plus 3 pi, right, it jumps back over there. And we could keep going with this, right? We could, we could keep going 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi, right? 6 pi is likely on that big large spot. Yeah, it's way out here, right? But this is going to go on forever. The, the main thing that you can notice uh, about these is that they're all on this one diagonal line here. They all go through this one point right here. There's actually a line that you could find that has that uh, being perpendicular to all of them. Okay, so the next example what we want to talk about here. Let's turn these off. Um, I'm going to zoom in back in. Our function was 3 plus 4 cosine theta. Okay. And that gives us uh, the, the limousine with the inner loop. Right? So there it is right there. It went by really fast. <laughs> Let me change the settings on this uh, slider here. Put that speed down a bit. See how it goes? It goes around this way. And then it goes through that origin point when R hits zero. And it keeps going and it keeps drawing that inner loop. But notice while it's drawing that inner loop, my R is negative. It's actually pointing in the opposite direction. And then once again, when it goes back through the origin point again, after it hits another R equals zero point, notice R is pointing back in the same direction as the theta. And then it comes back around and finishes out the, um, the thing there. Yeah, let me just put it at two pi and call it a day. 
Okay, so there's our curve, and we were tasked with finding the locations of the horizontal and vertical tangency points. In other words, the critical numbers, the critical values of theta. So I'm going to put the tangent line up there with the point of interest. And let's go ahead and punch in a few of these locations. Okay, so the two of the easiest ones, of course, are going to be 0 and pi. So notice at 0, I have an undefined line here. It's actually, uh, you know, being a, a vertical line. And then same thing at pi. Notice my tangent line is still undefined. Uh, and that's and that's really just because of the format that I have this in. Uh, let's go ahead and put the format back uh, on this thing to this guy. Let's see if that makes a difference for us here. No, it's not going to like it. Okay, so anyway, you can tell though that the the point is going to work out. There we go. Uh, I can get it really, really close. Right? So instead of pi, uh, if I type in, you know, just the 3.1, let's say. See, it's already getting close there. 3.14. The tangent is practically vertical there, as, as vertical as GeoGebra is going to be able to handle it, you can see. Okay? Now let's see. The, the next couple of values were... The, the vertical tangents, I had 1.955, so 1. Point, uh, let's do 95. See, there's one, and you can tell that these two points are going to be those. The other one was 4.328, so 4.32. There's the other one. Um, let's see what happens if I do the 8. No, it's all good. Very good. So those are all the vertical tangents. The horizontal tangents, we had the point um, 9955, point 9955. You can see that's the very top. Uh, we had the uh, 5.2876. which is the very bottom. And then we had the other two, uh, 2.7, I'm just going to round 2.74 there. And you can see there it is right there. Notice that's the, the lesser one. Because of the direction that this thing was spiraling, right, it actually hits that one first and then comes around and hits this next one next. Uh, 3.546. By one. And there it is, the point at the top right there. Next, the applications in polar coordinates with calculus. We want to talk about how to find the area inside of polar curves, between polar curves, uh, all of the variety of that such. Okay, so we've already seen the formula for this. Let's get some examples uh, of these situations. Okay, so calculate the area in one of the leaves of this particular lemniscate. Right, we've already seen this right here, this graph. It's the diagonal looking lemniscate, right? Uh, most people think of it like an infinity or a Mobius. Uh, the, it's a very particular, you know, shaping of the, of the Mobius called a lemniscate. <clears throat> and it comes off of the same idea as all of the, the rose petal curves uh, when, uh, whenever you have a normal R. This one's R squared. Okay, so <clears throat> with this one right here, if we want to calculate the area of this, then I just need to know a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to set up my integral. My area is going to be one half integral from theta 1 to theta 2 of r squared d theta, right? That was the formula. So what I need to know 
is if I'm going to, to integrate this here, right? I need to know a beginning angle and an ending angle. I need to know R squared, which I do actually. Lo and behold, I actually have R squared in this one. That's, that's what makes this one a little bit nicer. Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, times d theta. So let's start with the how do I know which angles? Well, notice the, the pedal on this lemnus gate here starts and stops at the origin. In other words, the, the way polar works, right, theta is rotating and R goes in and out. R goes in and out like that. So what's happening is as theta is rotating, R goes out for a little while and then comes back in. So what we're saying is if I can figure out all of the all of the theta values when R is a zero value, okay, then I'll figure out where this thing starts and stops. <coughs> well, right here, if you look at this, R is going to be equal to zero when uh, zero is equal to sine two theta. Sine theta by itself is zero anytime you have a multiple of pi. So zero, one pi, two pi, three pi, so on and so forth. This one right here is two pi. So I can even go down to the, the, the halves of pi, right? This is going to be equal to zero when theta is zero, of course, because zero times two is zero. Pi over two, pi, three pi over two, so on and so on, okay? So what's happening is when this thing goes around the full two pi, it goes out from zero and then back in at, two, at pi over two, which should make sense to you, right? Because it's rotating like this, and then it stops at the end of quadrant one and gets into the center and then doesn't do anything for a little while. Then when it hits quadrant three, right, it comes back out again. Well, uh, yeah, when it gets down to this part right here, right, it comes back out again. Okay, it's not actually uh, a quadrant three for him because of the, the, the two theta. But anyway, it comes back out again and then does the, the in and out from pi to three pi over two. Then it's back in and then it doesn't do anything for a little while. Okay, so between the zero and the pi over two, that's that first leaf right there between zero and pi over two. So that's my theta one and theta two. All right, so let's set up our integral. I'm gonna have the integral from zero to pi over two, r squared, uh, and don't forget the one half out front, I almost forgot it just then, All right, one half, r squared is just equal to 9 sine 2 theta and then times d theta. I didn't actually have to square it. It was already r squared in this particular example. So now I just have to do the integral here. That's going to give me 9 over 2 uh, times a negative because the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Uh, I'll have cosine of 2 theta but then I have to divide by that two also. So this is actually gonna become nine over four. And then it's being evaluated from zero to pi over two. Okay, if I plug in pi over two, I'll have cosine of two times pi over two is pi. Cosine of pi, so negative nine over four, cosine pi minus cosine of zero. So that's negative nine fourths times cosine of pi is negative one minus cosine of zero is one. So notice what I'm getting here is a, a negative one minus one is negative two, but times this negative. So what I've really got here is nine fourths times two which is nine halves. So the area of that one leaf right there 
is 9 over 2, okay? And you, you should see a pattern forming here. There actually is. The area of a complete lemnus gate is, is uh, just like a circle. It's related to an A squared, okay? But A is the length of this piece right here, okay? Or, or, or um, sort of. Uh, a, the, this length right here is 3 in this case because when the angle is pi over 4, right, it's going to hit this peak out here. And sine of uh, the 2 times pi over 4 is sine of pi over 2, which is 1. I'm just getting r squared equals 9, so r is 3, okay? My distance here is 3. And if I add both of these leaves together, the total area would be 9 over 2 plus 9 over 2, which is 9. And you'll notice 9 is that distance 3 squared, okay? Not a, not a coincidence on that one. The, the area of a lemnus gate is based off of that distance there. Okay, next stage up. If you have some sort of curve that loops back in on itself like this one does, and we've seen this one in quite a few different applications, right? We're throwing it around a bunch. Uh, I've got this uh, inner loop cardioid here, right? Uh, Lemison cardioid, whatever way you want to call it. Um, it's got an inner loop. And what I want to know is what is the area inside of the cardioid, inside of the lemison, but not in the inner loop, excluding the inner loop, okay? So you have to remember that the way that this works is radially, right? When I actually do the area of a piece of one of these graphs, right? It's gonna do it radially, like this. It's gonna stack in this direction. Stack, 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 like in a rotating fashion, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that this thing is uh, symmetric on the x-axis here, okay? And I'm just going to integrate the top half of the area there. And to get inside of just this section that doesn't contain the inner loop, I'm also going to integrate the inner loop, the inner loop, but I'm going to subtract it off, okay? So I'll, the, when I do the initial area from zero out to here, I'll get the full area. And then I'm gonna integrate on the inner loop as well, and then I'll subtract that off. But I'm only gonna do it to the top half. So each of them will only be uh, uh, half uh, what I'm actually doing, okay? Which means I'll have to double what it is that I'm finding. So let's set it up. First and foremost, I need to know where the, where the shape uh, folds back in on itself. I need to find this location right here where the loop begins so that I know where to stop rotating when I'm integrating the big area. Okay? Well, it's just like over here. It hits that center point when it's going to form that inner loop. So I'm looking for where does my R equal zero? So I'll find that first. Where does R equal zero? Well, that's 0 equals 3 plus 4 cosine theta. So we solve this, and I'm getting that cosine theta is negative 3 fourths. Okay, so that means that I'm going to use a reference angle of inverse cosine of just 3 fourths, but the negative is going to tell me for, for the cosine that I'm in quadrants 2 and 3, right? Should make sense to you, right? Because look at where this thing is. It's in the quadrant two when it finally loops back in and hits that center point, right? And then it goes on the inner loop. And then when it comes out, it's in quadrant three. The, the rotation has gotten this far into quadrant three once it comes out. So the, the two solutions that I get here from this are the theta where the inner loop begins. And it'll also be the theta when the inner loop ends. Okay, so the two uh, solutions that I'm getting here are this. I have that theta is equal to either pi minus inverse cosine of 3 fourths. I'll probably 
probably don't need these parentheses here. Okay, or pi plus inverse cosine of three-fourths. As I said before, I'm using the three-fourths, the inverse cosine of that, as the reference angle. If I do inverse cosine of three-fourths, that's a quadrant one answer. That's not one of the actual solutions to this equation. But I use that as a reference angle, right? Pi minus this and pi plus this. Pi minus will get me into quadrant two. Pi plus will put me down into quadrant three. I can actually get the two solutions for that uh, in radians. Theta is approximately 2.4189, or it's approximately 3.8643. So what we've found are the two amounts of rotation that theta is going to go through to both begin and then end the inner loop. So I can use these to help me set up my integration. Now remember what I said, I'm going to be using the symmetry of this graph to assist me in not having to go all the way around all through all of the different loop-de-loops and things like that. I'm just going to integrate the top half and then I'm just gonna double the result, okay? So here I go. The area that I'm looking for is going to be double two times one half the integral from zero to, and that's where I'm starting right here. And here's it, zero is here, and I'm gonna be going all along, you know, doing all of these radii here all the way until it reaches into this point in the center here. So that's going to be the 2.4189. Okay, and I'm integrating r squared. So that's going to be 3 plus 4 cosine theta squared d theta. This will give me the area of the entire inside. So now what I need to do is subtract off the inner loop. And remember, I'm doing this with symmetry. That's why this is doubling. So I'm only going to be doing the inner loop from this point until it hits the axis here. I'm just going to be doing that part from here to here, which will give me just this lower half of the area. And then it'll, I'll double it, and it's being subtracted off. Okay? So again, one half, because I'm doing an area in polar coordinates, it's starting at 2.4189, and it's ending at pi. Pi is when it's going to hit the axis again. Okay, remember, we're in a region where this particular function is using negative r values. So yes, I know pi technically is pointing that way, but the r is negative. So that's actually how you're getting the inner loop, okay? The r is negative, and so even though theta is going uh, this way, your r is going like this, and that's how it gets that inner loop. And of course, it's the same function. 3 plus 4 cosine theta squared d theta. Like so. Now, I was, uh, as I said, I was using the symmetry, and all that really does is it helps me by getting rid of these one-halves. I'm just going to distribute the two to both of these. Okay, so then I've just got these integrals. The first integral is still from 0 to 2.4189, and if I uh, multiply this out, I get 9 plus uh, 24 cosine theta, and then I have plus 16 cosine squared theta theta. And I also still have minus. That integral is still from the 2.4189 to pi of the same thing. 24 cosine, 16 cosine squared theta d theta. Now, of course, these integrals, I can do the 9 and the cosine liggity-liggity split. The cosine squared, remember, we have to do a power reduction for these integrals. Okay, so let's set that up. <clears throat> 
instead of 16 cosine squared, what I'm going to have is 8 times 1 plus cosine 2 theta. That's the, the power reduction. Remember, it goes 1 half, but I already had a 16. So 1 half of the 16 is where the 8 is coming from. And it's going to be the same thing uh, for this guy over here as well. I'll get the 8 plus 8 cosine 2 theta. So then, what I finally am integrating is going to be the 9 plus this 8. I'm going to have an integral with 17. It's from 0 to the 2.4189. 17 plus the 24 cosine theta plus 8 cosine 2 theta. D theta. Minus, same integral, 2.4189 to pi. Same thing, 17 plus 24 cosine theta plus 8 cosine 2 theta d theta. Okay, so then I can integrate this. I actually get 17 theta plus 24 sine theta plus 4 sine 2 theta. Because I'm integrating cosine into sine, but of course the inside function I have to divide by the 2. And this is still 0 to 2.4189. Minus something very similar, right? 17 theta, 24 sine theta. <clears throat> Uh, plus 4 sine 2 theta. And it's from the 2.4189 uh, to pi. Okay, so real quick, notice if I plug in 0, everything here zeroes out. And so really I'm just plugging in the 2.4189 into everything. What I get for this first tidbit here is save us some time here, <clears throat> uh, 53.026. And here, if I plug in pi, notice the sine of pi and the sine of 2 pi are both 0. All I'm getting for this one is 17 pi minus the same thing. So I'm actually getting minus uh, 17 pi minus 53.026. Notice what I did was I'm, I'm plugging in the same numbers, right, into the same functions. But what's going to happen is I'm getting this double negative thing going on here. Okay? This, this little piece right here comes out to be like 0.38. So I'm only subtracting a, a very small piece. The final uh, area comes out to be 52.0. Uh, six five ish units squared square units right okay <clears throat> okay so next calculate the area inside of r equals four but outside of r equals 5 minus 4 sine theta. Okay, so I've got uh, another limason there, right? Uh, but mixed with a circle. r equals 4 is a circle centered at the origin with a radius of 4, right? It's just 4 in all directions. And I drew these out uh, just to save us some time. But don't forget, when, especially when you have shapes that are intersecting things, Okay, when they're intersecting each other, you want to draw these out. Okay, whether the question asks you where are they intersecting or if the question asks you about the areas, it's going to benefit you to draw these out. Take the extra couple of moments, okay, plug it in some technology or uh, start to recognize the shapes, which probably you will need to do. Recognize the shapes and just throw, you know, a quick sketch down by hand. In a minute, we're going to look at GeoGebra, but look. If you can sketch it 
you know, that starts to help your thinking process. We want it inside of the circle, but outside of the limason. Okay, so here's the circle, you see? And the limason is a sine-based one, which means it's an up and down because sine goes with y. It's negative on the sine, which is why it's facing down. And then uh, the four, you notice that they're very similar in a radius of that sense. This one goes all the way down to not, uh, negative nine and then intersects here at one. Okay, so I've got this little piece right here that's inside of the circle, but above the, uh, the limason, above the cardioid there. Okay, so what do I need? I need to know where these locations are, here and here. Because what I'm going to do is integrate from this angle all the way to this angle over here. But I'm not going to be just integrating the circle. I'm going to be integrating the, the circle minus the cardioid, minus the limason. Okay, because as you can see, the limason is less, right? It's, it's closer to the origin, so the R is less at those particular locations. Okay, so the formula that I'm going to be using to get the area between these two is still theta 1 to theta 2, but you can sort of condense. I'd have a big R squared minus a little R squared d theta. Oh, what did I forget, guys? I forgot it again, just like before, uh, my 1 half. <laughs> really, it should make sense. It's basically the same thing I did here. It's just that when you're using the same curve in two different locations, it's not as easy to condense. But it's the same idea. I've got two areas that are overlapping, and I'm going to subtract away the one that I'm not interested in, right? So I'm subtracting away the lower one here so that I can have that upper outer region. And that's basically two integrals smashed together is all this thing really is. Okay, so first things first, I need to find the locations that they're intersecting there so that I know where to start and stop my integration. So let's solve for those. I'm going to have to set these two equal to each other because I want to know where the R is equal. Now, as we're going to see in a little bit, that doesn't always guarantee intersection locations, but it's definitely a good place to start. Where my R's are equal, I'm getting 4 equals 5 minus 4 sine theta. Okay, so then if I add the 4 sine theta, if I subtract the 4, divide by 4, I get that sine theta is equal to 1 fourth from that, which, as you can see, what I'm going to get are two answers, uh, just in one cycle anyway, between 0 and 2 pi, uh, where sine is positive is quadrants 1 and 2. Look, quadrant 1, quadrant 2. Makes sense, right? Okay. So then right here, uh, I'm going to say that my first theta is going to be just the inverse sine of 1 fourth. And my other one is going to be pi minus the inverse sine of 1 fourth. Those are going to be my two locations there. Remember, I'm using the inverse sine of the 1 fourth as a reference angle. And then I'm, I'm noticing that sine is positive in quadrants 1 and quadrant 2. So that's where I'm getting those two calculations. Okay? So in radians, theta is approximately equal to 0.2527. It's a little bit bigger than 14 degrees. And then in quadrant 2, it's approximately 2.8889. Okay. So I have my two locations here of the intersections. And I'm just going to straightforward integrate this one. So then... I'm going to have my area is equal to 1 half 
the integral from the 0 0.2527 to 2.8889 of the, the outer r squared, which is 4 squared. That's this, right? The circle is the outer one, the, the larger radius minus the smaller radius, 5 minus 4 sine theta squared d theta. And yeah, you could have just done those as two separate integrals. That's fine too. Okay. Notice that if you're integrating them separately, you're just going to subtract afterwards. Uh, that's our rules of integration. You can split them up, you can join them up, whatever works best for you. These two graphs just happen to be working in unison, right, with the same angle thetas, which is why I could condense it into one integral. Whereas over here, the, I had to, you know, write them separately because the, the angles were out of phase. They're uh, away from each other. Okay, so I had to, like, treat this as two separate areas where I was subtracting one of them out of it. Okay, so let's um, finish up this integral here. This is going to give me one half integral from 0 0.2527 to 2.8889. I've got 16 minus 25. Be careful now, you've got to distribute the negative after you square this binomial, okay? So I'm getting 40 sine theta and then I've uh, got 16 sine squared, so minus 16 sine squared. And don't forget that it's d theta. Okay, so just like before in this other one, I'm going to have to deal with that squared trig function there. Okay, so instead of uh, negative 16 sine squared there, uh, this is going to end up being minus 8, and then it's 1 minus cosine 2 theta. Okay, so this minus right here is that minus, and I'm going to end up distributing it. Okay, so I've got the, the 16 minus 25 here, and then I'm also going to have to have a negative 8. Okay, because this is going to be negative 8 plus 8 cosine 2 theta. So I've got negative 8, and then I've got the 16 minus 25 there. So that gives me, in total, a negative 17, right? Because that'll be 8 minus 25. Okay, so I've got 1 half integral 0 0.2527, 2 2.8889, uh, negative 17. I've still got the plus 40 sine theta, and now I've also got a plus 8 cosine 2 theta, d theta. So then my antiderivative is 1 half, I've got negative 17 theta, I'm going to have minus 40 cosine theta, right, antiderivative of the sine there, and then right here plus 4 sine 2 theta, because it'll be the, uh, the half again of that one. And then this is going to be evaluated between those two points, the 0 0.2527 and the 2.8889, okay? None of which is pretty and all of it must be done in the calculator, okay? So I've already uh, punched it in and saved us a little time here. This is what I came out with. I have one half times negative 12.3182 minus a negative 41.0889. Uh, all in all, this came out to be 14.385, right, square units. Uh, yeah, I did forget this over here, by the way. This is also square units, right? Uh, 
All right. So here are three applications of how we can find area in a polar format. Don't forget it's a, it's a rotational type of format. You need to, to, to see the, the stacks of the R values going in a circular fashion to visualize the way these areas are being built. And it also helps you visualize which ways you need to slice and which symmetries will work best for your situation. Um, let me show you what these look like just on the, on the polar side in GeoGebra so that you can get a real visual of the areas that we've just calculated. Now what I want to do is just show you some of the shapes here. Um, GeoGebra doesn't have a very good system for actually shading the areas, but that's why we have our brains, right? To be able to calculate these things ourselves, it just helps you to be able to visualize what's actually going on. So for the first example, we had a lemniscape, uh, which I have the function typed in right here, the square root of nine sine of two x. And of course the square root is there because in our normal equation it was r squared is equal to. But of course uh, to, to deal with things as functions here, I had to solve uh, for the r value, which in this case is being represented by f of x. So as I let this thing draw, that was really fast. Let's slow it down a good bit. Okay, so if I let this thing draw, notice what it does is it gets through this first petal, right? It draws the petal around this way and then it hits the origin again. And then watch, theta keeps rotating here. See, nothing has happened right now. Nothing is happening the whole time. Theta is just rotating here. And the reason is not because R is zero. R is actually complex defined here. It's, it's not being used in the real plane. But you'll notice as soon as it passes the x-axis here, it will switch back right there. And then right here it disappears again. And you see theta continuing to rotate until it reaches the very end again. So there's the lemniscate. And what we did was we computed the area in one of these leaves here. Right? And as you can see, um, the the uh, the radius there is three, right? You can see the the three radius to the to the point here. Um, more to the point, if I were to type in pi over four here for my point of interest, notice I get the point way out here at the Q uh, tip of it right there. Um, and then if I do the same thing right here, let's see, it's 0.79. Pretty close, pretty close, right? Um, you can see the length of the segment is 3, right? 3 is the length of that piece over there. And the same thing goes on the other side. The length is 3. So the complete area that we computed uh, was 9 over 2 for each leaf, right? So 9 total, which is that uh, that distance from the center to the outer point here of 3, uh, just being squared. Okay, uh, we once again looked at our uh, favorite Limasan cardioid 3 plus 4 cosine x. And this time we were integrating let me go ahead and let him finish out his drawing here. Pretty close. That ought to do. Okay, and then of course what we were doing was finding the area in here, right? Versus uh, the area in here. We were basically finding the area just between these two. And you can tell my drawing didn't do it as much justice as what you can see here. The inner loop is much, much smaller than the actual outer part of the curve there. Um, and the, the thing to notice is the points where it switches. 
so that you can see that what we were integrating is what it should have been. So it switches in quadrant two right here, 2.42, which we had 2.4189 to be more accurate, but you can see that's the point to where it hits, and then it's switching to the inner loop right here at pi, right? It's gotten halfway through. And this is actually what we integrated. We integrated all the way around. So we got all of this area, basically. And then we also integrated this little bitty piece and doubled it to subtract the inner loop out. Notice the inner loop then ends at the 3.86-ish here. Let it go around again. Pretty close. Yeah, you can see it, the 3.86 is where it ended. And then, of course, it goes back around for the rest of the cycle. Okay, so that's the area that we computed right there. Uh, and then lastly, we had the example uh, where we were comparing a circle of radius 4, r equals 4, that's what I have right here, r equals 4, uh, to a different lemma sine 5 minus 4 sine theta. Let me turn that one into a curve here so that we can compare these two. Uh, that's going to be our g function times cosine and then our g function times sine. Our t parameter is going to go from 0 uh, to 2 pi there. And of course you can see the, um, the pieces there. All right, let me uh, colorize these for you. Make it a little bit more vivid. Okay, so then what about our intersection points? We needed to find the intersection points between these guys, right? And that's exactly the two points that we found, but they're in rectangular form here. To give you the idea of what's going on, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a point at the center, right, which in polar coordinates is the pole, and I'm going to make little segments to each of these guys here. And then I'm going to make a segment that represents the x-axis here. So then the way that this was working was we were computing theta values so that we could get this area up here above the blue graph but below the red. So we were looking for locations of B and A and we were doing it with angles. So right here I can actually create angles, uh, D, C, B is 14.48 degrees, which if you convert into radians, uh, gives us the 0.2527 that we were using. And then the other angle is here, the 165.52, which if you convert into radians is the 2.8889, okay? So those are the two angle values, as you can see, and that, that gives us the area that we're interested in in between uh, these two here. Now I'd like to finish up with a couple more examples using integrals and uh, also to get into uh, the integrals of arc length. This first example here I also want you to dive deep into the idea of finding intersection points. Sometimes it's not as easy as just solving the equation, and that's important, okay? Because a lot of times we rely on all of our solving techniques to just give us all the answers. You've got to have a well-rounded understanding and skill-based knowledge of these things so that you know exactly what's going on, okay? Solving the equations to find the intersection points on two graphs always works in the places where the the input variable is in sync 
right? And that they're doing the the same things as the as the variable carries on. Okay. However, in polar coordinates, points can be passed. And and side note, by the way, this can happen in parametric equations too. Points can be passed at different t or theta or whatever values uh, the, the, the curve is being controlled by. And the curves themselves, mean uh, they could intersect. It just might be at different values of the input. Uh, that doesn't mean the curves themselves don't intersect. They still do. They just do it at different times or different uh, control points. Okay? Here's a good example. I want to calculate the area between the two uh, cardioids here, 1 plus sine theta and 1 plus cosine theta. Uh, polar uh, curves here and uh, I, I hope you notice it gave me fits here um, I did my best to draw these and, and I'll let you look at what this looks like in GeoGebra on the way out uh, you'll see it much better in the, in the computer drawing than mine but it helps to have this visual even without the computer drawing uh, so that you can uh, get on with you know figuring out how to do this so I want the area in between them right so that's this area in here and this little bitty sliver right here, okay? So now that I understand the shapes and I was able to get them up here like this, I can actually see that there are three intersection points, right? There's this one, there's this one, and there's this one. Let's solve for the intersection points. So I'm going to let... Uh, the two R's equal each other. 1 plus sine theta equal to 1 plus cosine theta. Like so. Now, of course, I can, uh, right here, subtract the 1 uh, from both sides. And what I'm getting is uh, sine theta is equal to cosine theta. Now, just from your knowledge of trigonometry, I hope that you're noticing that this happens at 45 degrees. But let's actually solve it. What I'm going to do is divide both sides by cosine. If I divide by cosine theta, then what I get is tangent theta is equal to 1. This you can actually solve on your uh, equation base here. Okay, so the, the tangent theta is equal to 1 happens in a 0 to 2 pi, either when theta is pi over 4 or when it is 5 pi over 4, right, at 45 degrees and at 225 degrees. Well, I want you to notice that what we've just found is this location here and this location here. And you can keep going, right? You could go with... Um, 9 pi over 4, then uh, what, 13 pi over 4, and it'll just keep on going forever. It'll even go in the negative direction as well. But what is that getting me? That's just going around and around and hitting these same two points over and over and over again. Notice this intersection point here is not included, but they definitely intersect there. These are both full-blooded cardioids that hit the origin. They both hit the origin. The problem is the equations are blind to the entire curve. They only see at one point at a time, right? The values of theta that you solve for give you certain individual points. But you and I, when we draw these graphs, we can take a step back and say, hey, wait a minute. There's one right there. I can see it. They intersect each other, just not at the same values of theta. See right here, the, the blue curve is the 1 plus cosine theta. It's going to hit the, the origin here when it uh, comes all the way around and the cosine theta is negative 1. So that'll be at theta equals pi. But the red curve, which is 1 plus sine theta here, is going to come all the way around. It's going to start right here. It's going to come all the way around this way. And then it's going to hit here whenever I get uh, sine theta is minus 1 which happens at 3 pi over 2, okay? So for each curve, they do actually go into the center there. They do share that point. 
However, they, they, it happens at different values of theta. But you and I both know from our knowledge of these curves that the, the way these things are set up is, is if these coefficients, if these numbers are equal, the one and the one, it goes to the center at a single point like a cusp. They still intersect there. I can see that, okay? And as a matter of fact, if you, if you think about it, the way these uh, lines are, and of course my drawing is, is for crap here, um, they're actually supposed to all line up. Mine's, mine's off scale, but all of these three points are supposed to line up because they're both at 45 degree reference angles here and here. It all lines up and it makes this beautiful symmetry where all I really need to do is find the area of one half of it here, like this. So really all I need is one of these curves. See, it's an entirely one curve right here. And if I start at this angle and just rotate on out and just do all of the, the area there with just, just this one R, and then the same thing, all, all of the R's here, and then double it. They're completely symmetric there. If I just find one of them and double it, I've got the area in between them. So that's exactly what we need to do, okay? So as you can see, they intersect at the pi over four and the five pi over four, that's here and that's here. And they also intersect when they hit this cusp right here, but I don't need to worry about that and I'll tell you why. Because the whole time, the R stays positive or equal to zero, okay? The R never goes negative. So if I just integrate all the way through, I'm not gonna have the problem uh, of adding positives with negatives. I'm gonna stay strictly with R's that are all positive, okay? And also in our integral, the R gets squared anyway. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to integrate the blue curve here. Just get this area and then we're gonna double it, okay? So the area that we're doing, the area between the curves is gonna be two times one-half integral from pi over 4 to 5 pi over 4 of 1 plus cosine theta squared d theta. So doubled it because I'm using symmetry here, right? And then one-half r squared d theta is all I'm doing. And it's between the specific points that they intersected at here, okay? Um, you could actually split this into two integrals if you wanted to take into account the middle intersection point. Because of the way my symmetry is set up, this particular problem I don't need to. But don't forget that you can, and sometimes you may have to. You, you always need to find all of the intersection points, even if your equations don't display them. Okay, so the two and the one half, of course, wipe out. Uh, and of course, I've got to integrate this by spreading it out. That's gonna give me one plus two cosine theta. And I'm gonna have cosine squared, but remember uh, that's going to be plus uh, one half uh, and uh, one plus cosine two theta, right? But what I did was I just distributed the one half. It's one half, one plus cosine two theta. Uh, and what that'll do is that'll just make it easy for me. I'm going to add the one half and the one here and get three halves. Okay, so let's do uh, my antiderivative here. I'm going to have uh, three halves theta, right? Because that's one half plus one is three halves, and then integrate. Plus two sine theta, and then plus one-fourth, co uh, oh, not cosine, don't make that mistake, sine, two theta, right? From pi over four to five pi over four, pi over four to five pi over four, naturally. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm going to do these one, uh, e each one of these a piece at a time, right? So in other words, I'm going to do the, the three over two 
and then I'm going to do top minus bottom. So that's 3 over 2. I've got 5 pi over 4 minus pi over 4, because all it is is just plugging it in for theta. Plus 2 times, I've got sine 5 pi over 4 minus sine of pi over 4 plus 1 fourth times. Now here we go, this is going to be sine of 2 times 5 pi over 4, that's sine of 5 pi over 2, minus sine of pi over 2. Right here, I'm hoping that you're noticing 5 pi over 2 is on the y-axis. Sine of an odd pi over 2 like this is either going to be 1 or negative 1, and they alternate, right? So sine of pi over 2, that's 1. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. Sine of 5 pi over 2 goes back to positive 1 again. This piece zeroes out. So what does that leave me with? Right here, uh, I've got 5 pi over 4 minus pi over 4 is going to be 4 pi over 4, which is just pi. So I've got 3 over 2 times pi. Okay, here this is square root of 2 over 2 minus square root of 2 over 2, uh, but this one's negative right here, right? Because it's in quadrant 3, sine is negative there. Notice that what I'm getting is a square root of 2 over 2 plus a square root of 2 over 2 basically, which is just going to be square root of 2 negative, but then times 2, so minus 2 square root of 2. And this is the actual area uh, that is in between uh, those two. Remember, I, I went ahead and doubled it, so that's actually the full area. What I have uh, written right here is the full area. The decimal approximation of one half of it, um, so it'll be 2 times 0.94... 1981. Let me double check the integral on that one. Yep. So then let's see, that's going to be uh, 1.883962. 3 over 2 times pi. Minus 2 square root of 2. Yeah, 1.8396. Yeah. Okay, so it's approximately that. So there's two problems that I need you to consider with this one example. Being able to do the area between the two curves and using the symmetry to your advantage, great. But also don't forget, being able to solve for intersection points is very, very important. Sometimes it's straightforward just finding the equation. Other times you've got to have those graphs, some sort of visual to assist you so that you know exactly how many points you should be looking for. Because like I showed you here, right? This one only gave me two of them, but there's actually three intersection points. Okay, next. Uh, I want to do the length of one of these curves, but then I actually want to do the length of one of these also because... Um, a lot of these integrals end up being what we call elliptic integrals. Uh, in polar form, we have a lot of these circular, uh, you know, curvature type of graphs, and they tend to lead into integrals that are of a more advanced nature that don't have close form. Um, this is a very good example of one right here. I just wanted to talk about this type of function because we hadn't really done it that much. It's a rose curve, right? It's one of the, the pedal curves that we do. And since it's an odd number, you get that number of pedals. I have five pedals here, which means that there's 72 degrees between each of the centers, uh, right, of each one. And, uh, and the distance, you know, outward on one of them is going to be three. It says calculate the length of the whole curve, basically, is what it's saying. So in other words, from beginning to end, right, all the way around. Okay, so to do that, what I would need to do is figure out 
um, basically these are all symmetric. So I really only need to do the length of one or even just a half of one. And that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to start right here, which is at zero for theta. And then I'm going to do this arc right here until it hits the center, right? Just this one piece. And then basically there's 10 of those, right? Okay, so how do I find that? Well, uh, this is theta equals zero, so I already know that, right? So my, my length is going to start at zero for sure. But then what about the other one? Well, notice it gets to the origin, right? So that's going to be one of my r equals zero points. So if I divide by three on both sides, right, I get zero over three, which is zero. And where is cosine equal to zero? Which angles do that? Well, that's pi over two, right? Three pi over two. So basically what I'm getting here is that five theta should be equal to pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, right, et cetera, et cetera. So if I divide by five, notice what I'm getting is pi over 10, three pi over 10, et cetera. Well, I only need the first one, pi over 10, right? So from zero is here, it hits the center here the first time at pi over 10, okay? Quick side note, you should realize that what that means is the period of the entire flower is pi, right? Because there's 10 half curves, right? There's 10 half curves, and it only takes pi over 10 to complete a half of one of the petals, right? And there's 10 of those. So it only takes pi to go through the whole thing, which goes like this, by the way. It goes around, then it goes to this one, then it goes up to this one, then down here, then around here, then back over here again. It doesn't do each loop one at a time like that. Okay, it actually keeps going through like it has momentum. It goes up and then it goes down, and then it goes through and then back around. It, it lets R be negative and positive like all over the place. Okay. Now, my integral here that I'm setting up, I'm going to go from 0 to pi over 10. And I'm doing arc length. So remember what that is, is that's the square root of the r squared plus dr d theta squared d theta, right? Um, that's, that's my formula, it's theta one to theta two. That's the formula that we're using here. So then this becomes the integral from zero to pi over 10 of the square root of r squared, that's 9 cosine squared 5 theta plus the derivative of r with respect to theta. Well, r prime here, notice, is just negative 15 sine 5 theta, right? r prime is negative 15 sine 5 theta here. So if I square that, I get 225 sine squared five theta. And then the whole thing's with d theta, okay? Now you could try to push this a little further and pick off nine of the sine squareds and combine them, but then you'd still have nine plus um, uh, 216 of the sine squareds left over. Okay, and you can try to do the power reduction and turn it into cosine of 10 theta short. Eventually, you're gonna hit a brick wall. Okay, there's only so far you can go. This is what we call an elliptic integral. Uh, there's different types of elliptic integrals, okay? But this is one of the, the major ones. I believe it's the second kind. Uh, elliptic integral of the second kind. And it, uh, it doesn't have a closed form. Okay, and there's advanced methods and, and special courses on just this kind of special function for just these kinds of things, and people specialize in this all the time. But for what we're doing, okay, uh, dead end, all right, for, for just learning about what we're doing here, I don't really need to go into an advanced analysis. I need to answer the question, what's the length? So at this point, you should just use your technology, 
there's going to be some sort of approximation. If you didn't have technology, if this was, say, you know, 100, 150 years ago, well, then, of course, then we have all those methods from last unit of using uh, our infinite series and Taylor series, uh, things like that. We could actually approximate this, right? One way or the other, you could do it without having the advanced analysis. Uh, fortunate for us, we have GeoGebra, we have Wolfram Alpha, we have all of those other pretty things that can assist us. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, when I type in this thing, I get um, that this is approximately 3.15151. Uh, I don't, I'm pretty sure it's not repeating, but um, that's what it comes out to be. And of course, when you do times 10, right, you get 31.5 ish for the length of your curve. Now, a lot of these integrals end up this way. So don't be too surprised if even the slightest bit of complexity, notice this isn't a very complex uh, polar equation. You know, even the slightest bit of complexity can bring out these ugly, ugly arc length integrals for arc lengths. Um, the ones that you can pretty much see that don't are these nice lemisons that are, you know, uh, pure same number cardioids. Even in these, though, if these two numbers are different, like the one we did earlier, 3 plus 4 cosine theta, even that one ends up being a nasty elliptic integral. But, for example, let's do one of these. Let's do the length of 1 plus sine theta, the red curve, okay? I'm going to do the arc length of that one. So if r is 1 plus sine theta, right, uh, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to notice the symmetry, and I'm only going to do the arc length of this half of it, right? So from down here all the way up to here. So in other words, I'm going to be doing my integral from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Okay, now I have an actual purpose for this and you'll see what it is uh, as I get deeper into the integral, okay? But also it's a nice way to, to shrink up the, the math a little bit, right? Has a nice symmetry here. The, the point right here is if you rotate to negative pi over two, it actually does the underneath swoop. And then to positive pi over two, it hits the, the peak of the red curve here, okay? So that's the integral that I'm performing uh, there. And then I'll just have the square root of the r squared, so that's 1 plus sine theta squared, plus the derivative of this is just cosine theta. So that's just cosine squared, d theta. Okay, so if I FOIL this out, I will get, uh, I have my integral, negative pi over 2, to pi over 2 uh, square root 1 plus 2 sine theta and then I'm going to have sine squared plus cosine squared right so that's actually another just plus 1 but let's go ahead and shrink it up this becomes 1 plus 1 is 2 so I have 2 plus 2 sine theta there in my square root d theta and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually take the, um, the square root of 2 out. Oh, I forgot. I'm doubling, right, because of my symmetry. I'm going to double the, the length here. So this should have a 2. So what I have on the outside now is 2 square root of 2 integral from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And I've got the square root of 1 plus sine theta uh, d theta. Right? I'm going to put it over 1. So notice all I did was I factored out a 2. It's in the square root, and I just pulled it out to the front. Okay? To, to engage this a little bit further into something that I can use a substitution with, I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by his conjugate. So times square root of 1 minus sine theta. Square root of 1 minus sine theta, like that. 
because in trig, conjugates tend to give you Pythagorean identities when you have the, the same number, you know, like here I have one and one sine theta, okay? So in my top there, my numerator, two square root of two integral, negative pi over two to pi over two, I'm gonna have the square root of one minus sine squared theta after I multiply that out. Denominator square root of one minus sine theta d theta. Okay, now here's where it gets fun. One minus sine squared, right? That's cosine squared. So what I have right here is the square root of cosine squared theta. And everybody's like, yeah, cancel, square root squared, boom, be careful. Technically, this is equal to the absolute value of cosine of theta. Be very careful here because cosine bounces between negative and positive values constantly. So when you square root and square this, you're supposed to pick up an absolute value or start splitting your integrals over different sections of negative and positivity. Now comes my symmetry argument. Do you notice the two values that I specifically picked here? Negative pi over two to positive pi over two. That's quadrants four and one next to each other. Those are both of the quadrants where cosine is guaranteed positive. So just because I chose these limits wisely, I don't have to worry about the absolute value. All of my cosine values are positive. So I can just carry on. Two square root of two, integral, negative pi over two to pi over two. Cosine theta is on top, d theta over square root one minus sine theta. I know, you think, you just made it uglier, Professor Simon, you just multiplied those radicals and it's a nasty mess, but not as bad as you think. Now look at this. If I let u equal one minus sine theta, then du is equal to negative cosine theta d theta, which if I pull a negative here and here, I've got exactly that. So then my integral becomes negative two square root of two integral of u to the negative one half. Because this is u right here, and it's in a square root in the denominator, and I'm just gonna bring it up. And then du is here because this is du right here. Now, what about my values of, of u right here? Well, let's see. When theta is negative pi over two, sine is negative one. So that's one minus negative one, which is two. And then next, pi over two, sine of pi over two is one, one minus one is zero. All righty. So that's negative two square root of two I get u to the positive one half, divide by one half, so that's another times two, right? Times two. Um, I'm gonna be careful here. I'm gonna divide by the one half here and I'll multiply it in a minute. This is gonna be evaluated from two to zero. Notice they're reversed, right? If you wanna reverse these, remember you can suck up a negative and I have that negative right here and I can just reverse these, zero, two. When I plug in zero, u is gone. When I plug in two, I have the square root of two. So look, two divided by a half is four, and then I have square root of two times square root of two for a grand total of eight. Okay, so a lot of these arc length integrals are nasty elliptical and, and things that you're just gonna wanna approximate. Every now and then, you will have an integral that you can do. You may still have to pull a few slick tricks, right, with your trigonometry to make them work. But some of them can work. 
Um, the ones that are circles, obviously, right? You can do the, the length of those. It's just circumference. Uh, but, you know, be careful when you're looking at these. Okay, so after you take a look at this, uh, in the, these things in GeoGebra, uh, I hope that this lecture has helped you see how calculus can intertwine with polar coordinates. Okay, so to finish this up, I just wanted to give you a much better graphical view of these things that I tried to draw for you on the board. Um, I have the 1 plus cosine theta and the 1 plus sine theta put in the polar slash parametric format. There's the 1 plus cosine theta, and here is the 1 plus sine theta. And you can see exactly how they overlap very, very symmetrically. The thing that I really want you to notice, though, is if I type in the line y equals x, notice how that line slices this thing exactly down the middle. If I were to intersect the these two curves, the blue and the red, notice it gives me that point right there, 1.21, 1.21, which is exactly on the line y equals x. And the line y equals x is at a 45 degree angle, so of course that makes sense. Also note, it actually intersects all three of the interchange places. And GeoGebra is having trouble even finding the other one. Uh, it's saying it's undefined. It's just having trouble finding the other intersection over here is all. Okay, so what we really did was we took this red curve, right? And we just integrated this upper side of it right here. As you can see, what, what's happening is that it, we just rotated in our integral. And so it, it integrated all of this area and then this little sliver right here. And then all, of course, we did had to do was to, uh, was to double it. And that gives us both halves uh, on both sides there. Um, the next thing for you to notice is that, uh, remember, I did the little side bit at the end which was uh, finding the length. And you can see I typed in the calculation right here, the length of curve B, right? The blue one right here, this is the one plus sine X. And uh, it calculated the length for us right here at eight. That's the length of the entire thing. Okay, next example, we were looking at three cosine five theta and I wanted to have that draw out for you as you can see the way it goes is exactly what I was telling you it doesn't draw each petal individually over and over again it keeps going around and around like it has momentum that keeps bouncing back and forth between petal to petal there okay and you'll notice that two pi it's already going around twice so I definitely don't need to have it going all the way around both times. Let's let it do just this one time. All right. Now, of course, the, uh, the length of this guy is something that I have computed right here. You can see the length of curve C from zero to pi. And remember, pi is actually one whole cycle. Um, and what it did was it calculated it for us the 31.52 is the uh, approximate length of that curve and of course GeoGebra has the means of approximating those lengths uh, and performing those elliptical type of integrals so I hope this has helped you visualize a lot of the polar stuff in a different way and uh, given you another way of thinking of how we can apply calculus uh, to these um, to these polar curves that we prefer uh, to study uh, with tangent lines and, and other things that we normally have.